diligent uh, or hateful, energetic, and with effort, the thought of sensual desire arose in me. I understood thus, uh, this thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered all of these things, this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose in me, I abandoned it removed it, did away with it. Right, so this is how you, this is great, great stuff isn't it, how to deal with bad thinking. And, and of course the same thing afterward is also about ill will, right, so same kind of technique is used for all the bad thoughts. So, um, the first thing which is of course interesting here is that the Buddha says a thought of sensual desire arose in me. Later on he says, a thought of ill will arose in me. Right? This is already quite important because it shows you that uh, the way the Buddha talks about himself uh, is in a way that we can understand very well. Same kind of problems that he had that we are facing in this world. Uh, and this is how you can see uh, the humanity of the Buddha emerging from the suttas. Uh, when you read it carefully like this and we see the implications of reading things like that, uh, you can see that it actually means that we're supposed to regard the Buddha in a, as a human being just like us. So, there's many other places in the suttas where similar kind of things are being said. Uh, there is, uh, I think, in the uh, Bodhiraja Kumara Sutta, Majjhamanikaya 85, uh, to Prince, uh, Prince uh, Bodhi. Uh, and in that sutta, uh, the Buddha says, uh, uh, talks about himself before his awakening. It says, before my awakening, when I had wrong view, right? Uh, again, similar kind of thing, when I had defilements, when I had wrong view. Uh, so you see, all of these things are, you know, are, um, uh, are, are there to kind of humanize the Buddha, make it more human, make it more, more like one of us. So, so these little indications, I think, are very important to take on board uh, because it makes it more clear who the Buddha actually is uh, and what he is not. Uh. So, as he did this, uh, photosensual aro arose. And first of all, he understands, right? This thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. And already, as I said, as I said before, this is already quite hard to do. Uh, in some cases, it's very obvious that sensual desire has arisen. In so other cases, not so arisen because it's very refined, and very, uh, very marginal, very hard to see here. Uh, but then, he thinks, and this is kind of the important point here, this leads to my own affliction. Affliction means suffering, basically. This leads to others' affliction and to the affliction of both. Uh, it obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nirvana. And then when he considers each one of those in turn, then it is abandoned in him, right? This is how he abandons these thoughts. So, of course, the interesting thing about this is that what he is doing here, he is using wisdom. There is no willpower being used here. All he does is reflect in the appropriate way. And by reflecting in the appropriate way, which is what you might call using wisdom, right? And by reflecting in the appropriate way, it disappears. It is abandoned in him. So the abandoning of defilements, the abandoning of wrong speech, wrong action, the abandoning of all the bad things. Uh, it is by reflecting in the right way that we abandon these things. Uh, which is very fascinating, isn't it? Uh, he 
if you think in the right way, then these things are abandoned as a matter of course. So, of course, when you undertake the five precepts, sometimes you have to kind of force yourself, okay, I'm going to keep these precepts, right? Uh, because sometimes there are kind of temptations coming up or whatever. Uh, so you, you make clear boundaries. But ideally, the way to keep the five precepts is to do it through wisdom. So it happens all by itself, naturally. That's the ideal way uh, of, of doing that too. And there is a nice sutta uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya that talks about uh, two different types of powers. And these two powers, one is the power of uh, reflection, patisankana, uh, patisankana uh, bala, power of reflection. And the other one is the power of development, the bhavana uh, bala. And uh, the power of reflection, says the Buddha, is the power which helps you to abandon the three types of unwholesome actions, right? Actions by body, speech, and mind. That is done through reflection. Now the bhavana, bhavana means like development, it refers to meditation practice specifically, sometimes it is broader than that, but certainly refers to meditation practice. Now the bhavana bala, that is the development of the uh, of, of the jhanas, the samadhi states, development of the seven factors of awakening, which also really are about samadhi. So all that is about developing samadhi, but the overcoming of the defilements is not done here through bhavana, through meditation, it's done through right reflection. And this is the power of reflection, patisankana bala, the fact that you use it in the right way, you actually, this is the way you abandon the defilements. This is exactly what the Buddha is saying here. He is reflecting, and by reflecting in the right way, uh, you abandon these things. So how does this work? How, how, how can you just think and then abandon sensual desire, right? It sounds almost too good to be true, man. If most people try that, it doesn't work. So how, so why, so how does it work for the Buddha? And the reason why it works for the Buddha, or he, he's not the Buddha yet, he's the Buddha to be. The reason why it works for him, man, is because he has an insight, he has understood what these things do. And this is the crucial issue here. So the crucial issue is, do you understand what sensual thoughts actually do to you? Do you understand the outcome? Do you understand where they're leading? If you really understand that they are leading to your own affliction, if you really understood that, of course you wouldn't think about these things. The reason why you have a sensual thought is because you think it's fun, right? And you fantasize about something nice or whatever it is, and you think it's good fun, and, right? If you're on the, on the, you go on a retreat and you can't eat it after, you fantasize about food, right? Or oh, nice. And, this is this is how this is just how it is. And, and uh, uh, but the Buddha says, if you really understand the danger, the mind just withdraws it as a matter of course, because you understand that that is dangerous. Uh, there isn't really any fun there, and it's just like. The simile I like to use, which is a very simple simile, you know, some, some, it happened to me, I remember as a child, uh, you, had, you, know, you had a hot plate in the house, you know, my mother had just cooked something or something, right? And, and I didn't know it was hot, so you put your hand on it, and it's like really hot, right? And, and so you don't have to think, you know, oh, should I remove my hand or not? <laughs> it happens automatically, right? You just withdraw it, it just comes back, it's like an automatic reaction. This is exactly the same thing as happening with the Buddha here. He doesn't have to, all he has to do is to remember that this is dangerous, it leads to problems. And the mind withdraws automatically, just like the hand withdraws from the whole plate. Exactly the same way here. So this is the power of reflection. You have to reflect so much, understand these things so deeply, understand that this is a dangerous area, and then you just guide your mind to the same reflection, and it withdraws straight away here. Now this is quite hard. For sensual pleasures it actually is quite difficult. And one of the reasons why it's difficult is because for the majority of people it's all we ever know, right? We don't really know about the profound happiness of samadhi. Once you know about the profound happiness of samadhi, then you can understand because then you have a comparison, right? Then you can actually understand this. But before, before you have that, it's actually very, very hard to see. So you need to reflect a little bit. And when you reflect a little bit, uh, you withdraw a little bit, and then again, and withdraw a bit more. And gradually, 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 as you do that, the samadhi becomes more deep, it enables deeper reflection, and these things kind of roll on uh, as a consequence. Uh, but again, as I said before, the emphasis for most people should not be on 
or reflecting on sensual pleasure is the emphasis should be on reflecting on ill will and anger because that is much more destructive emotion and also much easier to deal with than it is to deal with uh, sensuality. So I'm just talking about this now because it comes up first in this particular, uh, particular sutra. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't even know if I want to get into what the dangers of sensuality are because um, it is, uh, uh, I will talk about it later on, like, I'm going to get back to sensuality later on and talk a bit about the dangers later on then. because uh, but really, the, 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 one of the big dangers of sensuality, just to kind of say it, you know, say it uh, at this point, uh, is that you attach to things. Uh, and when you attach to things, uh, you're asking for suffering in the future. Uh, every time you attach, uh, you know that that attachment is going to be challenged. Uh, it's going to be broken up, right? Impermanence is going to, going to come and say, and rip it away from you. So whether that attachment is to other people, to family members, to a husband or wife, if it is to... Uh, your, your belongings, if it is to your uh, career or your status or whatever it is, uh, all of these things will eventually have to disappear. Uh, so in all of those cases, if you have attachments, uh, you will suffer as a consequence. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the things, right? It leads, there's more than that, and that is one of them. Uh, one of the other important things that people often underestimate is that sensuality is very closely connected to ill will. Uh, very closely connected because if you are attached to something and, and somebody comes along and kind of challenges it, challenges it, the attachment, uh, then you often get upset, right? Uh, if you know, if you think that if you are a husband, somebody's husband or somebody's wife, uh, and you think that somebody else is interested in your husband or wife, uh, that's you know, it's easy to get upset, right? Uh, or if it's your girlfriend or whatever, uh, it's very easy to get upset uh, because we precisely we have a vested interest in that person. Uh, so attachment and sensuality and anger are very, very closely related to each other. And you see that in the world. We're always fighting over things, fighting over relationships, fighting over the goods in the world. The cake, the economic cake in the world is always so large. If somebody else gets a larger slice, you get a smaller slice, right? It's unfair. This is how it often works. Of course, ideally, the cake grows. Everybody can share more. But often it is like, you know, the, the kind of the... Uh, that's why people get upset, right? When they see all kind of bad actions in the world, you know, recently seen all this, I don't know if you've read about this Panama Papers, have you remember this? Mm -hmm. Panama Leaks, yeah? All, all these people that there were supposed to be the leaders, right? They were kind of dodging away, putting away things, and not paying their taxes, and all this kind of stuff. But, and of course, it's easy to get a bit upset when you see that kind of thing, right? And somebody else is taking, taking my share. I am poor, I am paying taxes, for goodness sake. These guys, they're wealthy, not paying taxes. What's going on? And this is really unfair. Yeah. And that comes from attachment, basically. That's why you get upset. And, and the best idea is to say, okay, you shrug your shoulders. This is what happens. Okay, let's try to do something about it. But anger is not going to work, but not going to help out. Just an example. So, this is how you see the danger in these things, little by little, and gradually you build it up. And you see it is, leads to other people's affliction, right? So if you have, if you have desire, if you have a sensual desire, you know it's also going to be problematic for other people. Other people are going to suffer as well because of that. And because you have compassion for others, you say, okay, I better get away from that. And then you have both. Not only is sensual desire bad for you or the other person, Usually, it's bad for both people, right? So because it's bad for both people, again, you have a similar kind of uh, uh, interest in actually withdrawing from that. Uh, and then the last one is when you reflect that it obstructs wisdom. It causes difficulties. It leads away from Nibbana, right? Nibbana, extinguishment. It's more it's a literal translation of Nibbana, extinguishment. It obstructs wisdom. Right? If you have sensual desire or ill will, it obstructs wisdom. Why is that? Because it distorts your outlook. If you are angry about something, if you have desire about something, and you have a vested interest in that, that object. If you are attached to something, you have a vested interest. You're not able to see it, see it clearly. Sometimes people ask me, they say, oh, well, but I have to have attachment to my children, right? If I don't have attachment to my children, it's not going to work. You know, this, this, is how kind of, this is how life works, right? And if I don't have attachment, I won't look after them properly. I won't kind of do the right thing. 
But usually it doesn't work like that. Usually it's actually the other way around. If you are very attached to your children, uh, if they do something wrong, then you get very upset uh, because you have a very strong attachment, you have a very strong vested interest. This is my child, you're very proud of them, right? Uh, and you say to all the oh, this my child is getting really good grades at school, right, whatever, and you're really proud of that. And then one day they get bad grades. What happens then? Uh, you feel really bad if you're terrible because you have attached to the idea of your child being very successful, getting good grades. Uh, and this is the problem. The more attachment you have in that area, the more it's, kind of, it's going to have uh, bad repercussions. So actually, less attachment is often good. If you have less attachment, then if your child does well, if your child doesn't do so well, okay, fine. As long as you're happy, as long as I you know, do my best at helping you out and having a good life, that is more important. Too. Right? So you have more, instead of being concerned about yourself, about you feeling good about your child, you're more concerned about the child's direct happiness rather than whether it looks good on you or not. My child, you feel proud of your child. Actually, it's not about you, it's about the child, right? Whether the child is happy or not. So a lack of attachment makes, gives you more clarity because you have less vested interest. And then you can start to see the child's or anybody else, uh, anybody else for that matter, you can see, start to see their true, uh, what they really need, and then you can give them what they really need, rather than what you want from them, because it reflects on you. Uh, it's a big difference. So, just an example of how attachment and desire, and also ill will, ill will distorts also our outlook enormously. When you have ill will, you think that what is right, wrong to do, is right to do that. And you do all kind of bad things as a consequence. So, so wisdom is obstructive. You don't see clearly. You don't understand what you should be doing. And that's scary, right? Don't you want to be wiser? Is there anybody here who does not want to be wiser? <laughs> you probably wouldn't be here, right? If you, if you thought it was better to be stupid and silly, not to have any wisdom, you probably wouldn't be here. Of course you want to be. Everybody wants to be wiser. Because wise wisdom means that we understand how to negotiate life. We understand how to deal with people. We understand in which direction happiness lies, in which direction suffering lies. That's what wisdom means. So wisdom is the greatest asset you can have as a human being. If you don't want wisdom, it means you don't know what wisdom is, that's basically what it means. Of course people want wisdom. So for that reason, when it says here that it obstructs wisdom, Panya, erotic, I think, jeepers, I'm throwing away the best part in life, right? By having sexual desire, by having ill will. What should I choose, ill will or wisdom? It's, it's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> it's pretty obvious that we're going to choose to be wise rather than having, the, uh, having that, you know, uh, indulging in ill will or whatever. Still, it is hard to do. Sometimes you feel so self-righteous, you know you're right, so still you have a little bit of ill will. Uh, it goes a long way along the path. Uh, but at least to have a little bit of understanding of the danger they know. It causes difficulties, right? It causes pain, basically. When you have an ill will, if you go to the feeling of ill will, it doesn't feel good. If you have the choice between a very relaxed and easy state and ill will, if you compare them, one is so delightful compared to the other one. One is very painful. If you compare sensual desire to a state of complete contentment, you will see that sensual desire is like this agitation, restlessness, like this burning inside which drives you forward, right? That's what sensual desire is about. It's about looking into the future, trying to acquire something. There's a very profound, restless, and agitated energy that comes with sensual desire. It's not really nice. The only reason you think it's nice is because you're looking forward to the object which you're going to acquire. Oh, I'm going to get into this wonderful relationship, right? I'm going to run after this person or whatever. But actually, the feeling itself, you don't think about the object of it that you want to acquire, the feeling itself is not, is not pleasant at all. That's the craving, the feeling of desire inside of you actually is problematic. So these are all, actually, they're not very nice feelings. And once you start to understand that, and you start to have some idea of the meaning of contentment and tranquility, you have no doubt anymore where it is that you want to go. And the last one is, uh, it leads away from Nibbana. So is that that's a, doesn't sound very good, does it? Uh, <laughs> so what, what is Nibbana anyway? So it's, sometimes we have well, Nibbana is kind of a, this, this word that sounds, kind of sounds good. We're, we're kind of told that it is good, right? So, so it kind of sounds good. But 
And it's important to have some feeling for what Nibbana actually means. Uh, and a good translation of Nibbana is extinguishment. Things get extinguished. Uh, and uh, that uh, gives you less opportunity to read all kind of things into the word Nibbana, when you don't know what it means. Uh, what is it that gets extinguished? The things that get extinguished. Uh, number one are all the defilements, right? Uh, they get extinguished. Uh, so all the defilements, all the craving, all of those, all of those problems, uh, they go away. And one of the most important things that get extinguished is dukkha, is suffering. Uh, so if you are moving away from Nibbana, it means you're moving into suffering, into more defilements, away from peace, away from quietness, uh, away from extinguishment of all these things. Uh, so uh, instead of moving towards all these wonderful qualities uh, that are there and available on the path, uh, you're moving towards all the bad ones instead. Uh, so again, it is not something that you really want to do. Uh. So this is how the Buddha, uh, not the Buddha yet, the Buddha to be, how he uses his wisdom uh, to enable him to move away from these things. So it's very fascinating, isn't it? Uh, and uh, it, it shows you the power of reflection when you reflect in the right way. Yeah. And then, and then comes the, the sentence which is very interesting here. Never the thought of sensual desire arose in me. I abandoned it. I removed it. I did away with it. Right? This, these words that I'm, I'm reading there are pretty much exactly the same words as I was reading out in the other sutta. The translation is a bit different, but the Pali is actually almost exactly the same. The other one it said, he abandons it, dispels it, terminates it, obliterates it, right? Here it says he, he abandoned it, yeah, removed it, and did away with it. But actually the Pali words are basically the same. So again, you can see this whole idea of abandoning, of obliterating, of doing away with things, which sounds so forceful and so powerful, it sounds like an act of will, it isn't. Everything here is through an act of reflection, through an act of wisdom instead. And here it is very clear that that is the case. You use wisdom to abandon these things. You think about things in the right way. The power of thinking, if you use it rightly, the power of reflection is very, very useful on the Buddhist path. But it's all about using it in the right way. Okay, so uh, then that is all about the sensual desires. And then comes the paragraphs that are probably uh, more important because the focus is on ill will. And the Buddha to be says, as I abided thus, diligent, uh, heedful, energetic, and with effort, uh, a thought of ill will arose in me. Uh, a thought of uh, ruthlessness or inconsiderateness is another way of translating that arose in me. Uh, I understood thus uh, this thought of being inconsiderate or ruthless has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to the affliction of others, uh, to the affliction of both. Uh, it obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, uh, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered thus, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of being uh, ruthless arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, and did away with it. Uh, it's the same thing, right? Uh, you know that it leads to when you have a thought of ill will, right? You understand how it hurts yourself, and, uh, how you are creating all kind of problems for yourself when you have ill will. It is, I think, it's fairly, fairly obvious. So, uh, in my life, I've always noticed that the people who are kind, who have, have a sense of compassion, they are the people who tend to be liked, right? Angry people don't really like angry people that much. You kind of, well, kind of be careful when people get too angry. You don't want to get too close. You're afraid you might get burned, right? The people with kindness are the people who tend to attract people or other people around them. And this is the first thing. You tend to get very lonely if you have too much anger. And if you are ruthless, well, you get a bad reputation very quickly. And as in the previous ones, of course, also you heap up a lot of bad karma. You feel very bad inside. It is one of the most powerful contemplations about anger to make you understand the bad effects of anger is just to feel inside of you how you feel often about being angry afterwards. So very often you feel deflated. You have an angry thought. How does an angry thought feel? And very often it saps your energy. It gives you a boost of energy right away, right? Anger, okay, self-righteous. 
but in the long term, it saps your energy, saps your mindfulness, saps your joy, saps the happiness of life, right? It draws that out of you. Man. And when you see that, uh, it becomes a very powerful source, for not a very powerful motive for uh, abandoning anger. You can see how it affects your mind very directly if you are mindful about it. Uh, Anyway, so very similar considerations here with anger and, and ill will, as I said previously, with sensual desire, but actually uh, easier to see with anger than with sensual desire. And uh, uh, okay, then we have. Uh, I'm going to change one paragraph around. I'm going to skip one paragraph. This is because in the Agama version of the Sutta, there's one paragraph comes before the other one. Uh, so they do the simile first of all, just as in the last month of the rainy season, in the autumn when the crops thicken, a cow herd would guard his cows by constantly tapping and poking them on this side and that with a stick to check and curb them. Why is that? Because he sees that he can be flogged, imprisoned, fined or blamed if he lets the cows stray into the crops. So too I saw in unwholesome Qualities, the danger, degradation, and defilement, uh, and in wholesome states, the blessing of re renunciation, the aspect of cleansing. Uh. Right? So the, uh, he had the cows, the cows is like the mind, right? Uh, so your mind is like a cow. Does that sound good? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you have. You have this cow, you have this mind, right? So you tap it a bit on this side, don't walk there, don't this essential desire, don't go to essential desire, don't go to anger, middle path, middle path, right? <laughs> Tapping it all the time, don't go into the crops. So this is what this is all about. So you're kind of you're head, heading in the right direction. Uh, and because he understands, right, that if the cows they stray into the crops, he will be punished, right? Go to prison. This is what it means. If you stray too much into ill will or whatever, you will get punished. You will get punished because you will feel bad. You will have all these negative consequences coming as a consequence. So it's just like you're asking for punishment. If you, are, if you uh, allow ill will to come into your mind, you are asking for punishment as a consequence. Why ask for punishment, right? It's a stupid thing to ask for. No, enough punishment already in this world. Don't need to add anything to all the problems we already have. So once you get that into your mind, into your head, and that's what's happening, it becomes a powerful cause for avoiding that in the future. So that is that simile of the cows. And interestingly here, he saw in those unwholesome qualities the danger, the adinava, degradation, or kara. Kara means to make low. Right? If you, I don't know if you noticed that, but if you have a lot of bad qualities in your mind, it's like you feel lower in a sense, you don't feel so, uh, you know, you, you don't feel so good about yourself, you don't feel so good about yourself in the company of others and all these kind of things, and if your mind is full of bad qualities, and if your mind is full of good qualities, you feel at ease and relaxed in the presence of other people, and you feel much more, uh, much better about yourself as a consequence, so I'm sure you have noticed that sometimes, uh, and one of the things that it says in the suttas is that if you are a very virtuous person, if you have a lot of good qualities, you feel at ease, it says, in the assemblies, right? It's easy to kind of talk with people and to be, you know, to talk to groups of people or whatever it is because of those good qualities inside of you. So it has, has that added benefit as well there. So you don't feel so low, you feel like equal to everybody else, right? You don't, you don't necessarily feel superior, but you feel that you have the, you know, you have the authority to speak or whatever. So it makes you feel low these days, which is of course not very nice. It makes you feel defiled. You feel impure. Right? It's not a nice feeling. You feel impure inside. The purity of the heart is a very beautiful feeling. The purity of the heart is a feeling where you feel light, you feel mindful, you feel joyful. And it's a very good and positive feeling inside of you. Impurity is the opposite. You feel like dirty or whatever. You know? So this is why it is called defilement. And of course, the wholesome states have the opposite, the blessing of renunciation, of giving things up, and the aspect of cleansing him. And then, let me go back to the previous paragraph. Because whatever a person frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of their mind. If they three frequently think and ponder upon thoughts of sensual desire, he has abandoned the thought of renunciation 
to cultivate the thought of sensual desire. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of sensual desire. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of... Uh, that's a mistaken text, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of, of ill will or upon uh, uh, ruthlessness, he has abandoned the thought of non-ruthlessness or compassion to cultivate the thought of ruthlessness. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of ruthlessness. So this uh, gives you an idea of why, of how the mind works. The mind works according to habits, right? We are creatures of habits. Uh, and this is one of the most difficult things on the uh, Buddhist path, is precisely this, uh, uh, this effort we try to do to change our habit patterns, to move in a new way. Uh, right? Sometimes there are certain people that give rise to certain, rea uh, certain reactions in us. Uh, have you noticed that? This person comes into the, the room and straight away you feel something. Either maybe you like them or you don't like them, but there's like an emotional reaction that we have to certain people. Uh, Right? Or in a family, the families were so close together, and we know that when this person says this thing, it always upsets you, right? Every time, because it's like a habit that has formed, like deep habit patterns that kind of inform inside of you. Very often this happens between husband and wife, right? They know how to push each other's buttons, right? How to kind of, you know, get each other to react when they, when they, when they want to. And this is because of the ancient habit patterns have kind of been laid down and laid down in you over so many years. So, so this is the hardest thing about this path, is actually to challenge those habit patterns, to think in new, one, in new ways. So, and at the beginning is quite harder. But what is interesting here, what is said, is that if you free, frequently think and ponder upon these things, then gradually your mind is changing, right? And if you frequently remind yourself of the danger of these things, and you forgive people, you have metta, you have compassion, you have understanding, you have all these good qualities. And gradually your mind is changing and your habits are changing. And after a while, you can't think bad thoughts anymore, right? Because your habit is to think good thoughts. This is what happens. And this is it's very, it's very nice when you see that happening inside of you. You see that your, the way that you think about other people, it is no longer the same from what it used to be there. It used to be very upset by this person, now you have compassion instead, because you realize, actually, it was that person's problem. It's not really your problem. If you make it your problem, then, of course, that is where the problem arises. So you're laying down these new tracks in your brain. These days we talk about neuroscience, right? The, the tracks, kind of certain tracks that have been laid down, certain pathways in the, in the brain that have kind of been established, so you have to think in a certain way. So you can imagine, this is almost like laying down new tracks, erasing the old ones. Now you kind of your thoughts go through different pathways, and for that reason you are thinking differently. And this is really what this is about. So you're creating new habits for yourself. And this, I think, is one of the most challenging things about uh, the Buddhist path, is actually to challenge uh, your old habits. Uh, start to think in new ways. Uh, and gradually, as you do that, it builds up momentum, and it becomes easier and easier and easier as you go along. Uh, until one day it becomes this natural, it becomes a matter of course uh, that you are thinking in a new way. Uh, this is what this is all about, this idea of uh, frequently think, uh, thinking and pondering upon a certain thing, uh, and then the opposite becomes, uh, becomes abandoned because of that. So if you think a lot about uh, sensual desire, the idea of renunciation uh, becomes abandoned as a consequence, right? So you, uh, you cultivate the opposite, and then you learn, and then you kind of the mind leads in a different direction. So here you can also see quite clearly that renunciation in the suttas it is the opposite of sensual desire. So it is about not, uh, non-sensuality is really what is the main focus of renunciation in the suttas. Okay, so, uh, that is the negative side of this sutta. This is all about how to overcome the, the bad thoughts. And the next side of the sutta is how to develop the good thoughts instead. And this is even nicer. Sometimes when you talk about all the bad stuff, it kind of it's too bad, but now we talk about the positive side instead. As I abided as heedful, energetic, and with effort, the thought of renunciation arose in me. I understood thus. This thought of renunciation has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own affliction, 
or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom, does not cause difficulties, and it leads to Nibbana. If I think and ponder upon this thought, even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body, and when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from stillness. So I steadied, and my mind internally quieted, brought it to singleness, and stilled it. Why is that? So that my mind should not be strained. So this is um, this is very interesting, and, and uh, it, it fits in very well with what we were seeing in the previous sutta. So it's worth while just considering this briefly before we move on. Uh, so now he's using the opposite, he is seeing a thought of renunciation, which means like a thought of giving up sensuality, giving up attachments, right? No, I don't want that. I'm giving it all up, and you're seeing the benefit of that. That's really what it means. So it's like, yeah. So it's like when you go forward, right, you become a monastic or whatever, you say, okay, I'm going to give up that whole, all that other stuff. Or when you sit in a cutie by yourself, you go on a meditation retreat and you think, yeah, let the whole world be, leave it all behind, I don't want to deal with it. That's like a thought of renunciation. And then you understand that this does not lead to problems, right? It doesn't lead to suffering. It aids wisdom because you get clarity of mind. It does not cause difficulty. There's no pain involved with that. Pain is letting go of and it leads towards Nibbana, right? It leads towards this extinguishment of all the problems, all the fires inside, all the agitation, all the things, all that gets extinguished. And you feel cool and nice inside as a consequence. So thoughts of renunciation, and even more obvious with thoughts of non-ill will. Thoughts of non-ill will, you can call it thoughts of metta, loving kindness if you like. Not exactly the same, but very close to each other. And then thoughts of non-cruelty or non uh, or uh, being considerate, I like thoughts of very close to letting thoughts of compassion. Uh, so all of these things are part of this. Uh, and then he says, because they all lead in the right direction, I, he says there's nothing to um, uh, see no fear from it, even if you think about this for a whole day or a whole night or a whole night a day. Uh, so these things are not dangerous, uh, they are okay, they lead in the right direction. Uh, but, and this is the interesting part here, right? Uh, with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when it is strained, it is far from stillness. Uh, so this is very similar to what we're seeing in the previous sutta, is that uh, it is not enough just to get to the point where you have nice thoughts and you think about things in, things in a nice way. Ultimately, if you want to find true meaning and true relaxation and true uh, kind of true release from problems, you have to give up thinking altogether. Even the good thoughts, right? Even the thoughts that accord with the Dhamma, accord with the teaching, have eventually to be given up. And only then do you come to a true sense of peace, like the real holiday, right? People think they go on holidays overseas. No, it's just more stress. They come back, I don't know about here, but in Australia, people go overseas, have a holiday. Wow, oh, really tiring holiday. <laughs> so many, doing so many things, running around with all this stuff. Oh, I'm glad to be back at work again. But <laughs> sometimes it's like that. So the real holiday, the problem is that we are not able to give ourselves a holiday because our minds are so hyperactive. The real holiday happens when everything comes down. Everything becomes beautiful inside. You become incredibly peaceful. That is when you feel have a real holiday. What does it feel like to have a real holiday? You feel energized afterwards, right? It's the opposite of being tired. You feel energized. When you come out of a state of samadhi, Ajahn Brahm is famous for very profound samadhi. He says, you feel like a nuclear reactor when you come out, right? Would you like to feel like a nuclear reactor? No. Uh, <laughs> too much energy? No. I don't know if you like a nuclear reactor, right? So this is incredible amounts of energy. And that's how you know you've been on a real holiday. You really have relaxed, right? So this is what this is about. So if you really want to relax, 
all the thinking has to be let go. But of course, it is very easy to let go of the kind thoughts. It is the unkind thoughts, the defilements that are hard to let go of. And these kind ones are relatively easy to let go of. Not entirely easy, because even that last amount of samadhi can be hard to uh, attain, because you have to let go of other things, like the sense of self, that sort of thing. But still, probably easier. Yeah. So it is a little bit, the way it is expressed here is, a, uh, is a, perhaps a little bit unusual. Uh, thinking and pondering might tire the body. What does that mean? Why does it tire the body? Why does it tire the mind? That's supposed to mean that. And uh, I am not 100% sure what it means, to be honest with you. But um, uh, one way of interpreting that is to think of it as the brain getting tired, right? The physical body getting tired. If you think a lot, it will affect the physical body. Uh, and often you can see that. You go to work, you work very hard, you concentrate on things, maybe things you don't find so interesting. And when you come back home in the evening, you feel exhausted as a consequence. Uh, so this may be a physical tiredness, that if the, if the mind had been released from the body, it might not have felt that tiredness in the same way. Yeah. So it may be related to the physical body. That's just my speculation. The word body, kaya, in Pali can mean different things, so it is not 100% uh, clear cut. That is certainly one interpretation. And of course, when the physical body is tired, as we were saying before, because the brain is a filter for the mind, it will also affect the mind. So the mind, as I said here, will become strained as a consequence. And when it is strained, it is far from stillness, far from samadhi. And then we have this, these terms that we heard before. So I steadied my mind eternally, quieted it, brought it to singleness, and stilled it. And this, you probably remember from the previous sutta, exactly the same words, right? These are the words that mean taking the mind to jhanas, to the samadhi states. Basically it means the jhanas. And in the suttas, the jhanas, they come up soon afterwards. Why is that? So my mind should not be strained. So this is how the Buddha practicing before his awakening him. Okay, so let us just, uh, I'll just we have a few more minutes, so I'll just uh, uh, finish off uh, uh, this sutta. Uh, and uh, it says, next one here, that uh, as I abided thus diligent, ardent, or heedful, energetic, and with uh, effort, uh, the thought of non ill will, or perhaps metta, arose in me, a thought of compassion arose in me. I understood thus. This thought of compassion has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own suffering, to the suffering of others, or to the suffering of both. It aids wisdom, does not cause pain and difficulties, and leads to extinguishment. If I think and ponder upon this thought, even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. When the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from samadhi, from stillness. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted, brought it to singleness, and stilled it. Why is that? So that my mind should not be strained. So all of these beautiful thoughts, which all are leading in the right way, eventually you have to give them up as well and enter a state of samadhi. Uh, just skipping one paragraph and going to the second last one. Just as in the last month of the hot season, when all the crops have been brought inside the villages, a, a cow herd would guard his cows while staying at the root of a tree or out in the open, since he needs only to be mindful that the cows are there. So too, there was need for me only to be mindful that those states were there. So now, the, the, you know, there is no crops uh, to be eaten, so the cows are kind of not going to do the wrong thing. And so the cow herder sits down at the root of a tree, relaxing, chilling out, uh, and not, not having to be too worried about things. All he has to do is to make sure the cows are there. You can't really afford to lose the cows, because if you lose the cows, right, that would be getting in trouble as well. 
And in the same way, you have to be mindful that those states are there. You can't afford to lose those states. So you have to make sure that those mental qualities, they remain in your mind, right? And this is what this uh, is referring to. And then we backtrack to the previous paragraph. Bhikkhus, whatever a bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of renunciation, he has abandoned the thought of sensual desire to cultivate the thought of renunciation, and then his mind inclines to thoughts of renunciation. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of uh, metta, thoughts of kindness, thoughts of uh, compassion, he has abandoned the thought of ruthlessness to cultivate the thought of compassion, and then his mind inclines to uh, thoughts of compassion. This is what we're trying to do here. Redirect the mind, direct the mind in a different way. And so instead of having all these thoughts coming up all the time, which we don't really want, to, instead the mind naturally uh, comes up with a good, a positive thought. So, and remember now to the sutta I was talking about earlier this morning about the uh, mountain, making a mountain of good actions. Remember that one? Uh, right? So this is what this is about. Uh, the mind inclining in the right way it means that you have made a mountain of good actions. It means that when you sit down and when you sit back, it is natural for the mind to go to the good thoughts, right? So when you come on a meditation retreat or you meditate, all you have to do is sit back and wait. And as you sit back and wait, as you calm down, you allow your tiredness or restlessness or whatever it is, you allow that to disappear, to dissipate, then the natural underlying state, which is deep inside of you, is the, it is the state which is the natural tendency of your mind to be kind, to be compassionate, to renounce, renounce these things. Because this is the natural underlying state of mind. That once your tiredness goes away, once the restlessness dies down, this is what arises in your mind. And this is how meditation works, right? And this is why very often all you have to do, especially when you're starting off a meditation retreat, all you have to do is just wait. And you wait and you wait until the natural state underneath arises inside of you. That is the ideal way of doing meditation practice. So you have put into place all the right things, you have directed the mind in the right way, and then when you want to meditate, it just happens. Easy, right? So easy. Yeah. And this is it's wonderful and it's so easy because it means that nothing, nothing much you have to do. Just wait, just sit back. You don't need to kind of do all this. Uh, <laughs> so this is kind of the idea, and it's so it's so good that it should be easy because it's not, we, we want our spiritual path should be one which is happy, which is fun. We can feel relaxed, right? We don't want to stress out. There's enough stress in the world already. We don't want to make this life also into stress for them. But this is kind of the beauty of this. This path is when it's practiced in the right way, a very beautiful path that can alleviate so many of the problems in life. Uh, and this is what you're seeing here. Uh, okay. Um, there's one sentence left of this particular sutta. I'll read it out as well just, to have, just so we can read it. Tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind was stilled and unified. Tireless energy, right? You have abandoned all the defilements. You have concentrated the mind. Energy inside of you is just bubbling up. This is one of those uh, beautiful things about um, Buddhist teaching is that in the beginning of the path, you have to create the energy. You have to make an effort to make the path work. But as the path kind of becomes part, as the path becomes more natural, the energy comes from inside of you. It comes naturally. You don't have to exert yourself anymore. The energy is there, right? This is the difference between the word virya and the word vayama in the Pali language. Vayama means you are exerting yourself. Or padana also means you are exerting yourself. This is the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. But once you get the meditation becomes deep, once the samadhi starts to bite, there's a natural source of energy inside of you. And energy just comes up. This is what it means. Tireless energy. The energy doesn't run out. You don't have to make it. It's a natural part of you. Now. Unremitting mindfulness, right? Mindfulness is strong. It doesn't, it doesn't um, disappear. It is there all the time. It is strong. Always
is there, because the energy is strong, because the joy is there, the mindfulness is also there. It is so nice to be in the present moment. We don't want to be anywhere else. If you don't want to be in the past and the future, because the present moment is so nice, well, that's where you're going to be. And the mind is glued into the present moment. That is what he is saying here. The body is tranquil, it is untroubled, right? When you meditate, always make sure the body is happy first of all. Because when the body is at ease, it means it's much easier to be mindful. And if the body is troubled and you have tensions or whatever it is, starting off with the body, making the body kind of disappear into the background. That's what's going on here. The mind is unified and still as a consequence. And of course, from there, that is where you go into Samadhi again, just as we saw with the previous Sutta. Okay, so that is all for now. So, uh, uh, very good. So, we have about half an hour to break, I think it is. And we'll see you again for the Q&A at quarter to five. So have a nice cup of tea or whatever, and see you later.